Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's student visit with um, Alex Yu. And today, our moderators are Rafi and Joseph from Parasites uh, Workshops for Arts, uh, Emerging Arts Professionals. So before we start, Rafi and Joseph, would you like to introduce ourselves? Yes. Um, hello, Joseph. Do you mind if I start first? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yes. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe you start first. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rafi. So I'm from Singapore and I'm currently working at a local art gallery after having just graduated from um, LaSalle College of the Arts under the Arts Management Program. So uh, I'm, outside of that, I'm working on some um, independent writing and curatorial projects. So uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining us online tonight. And also thank you, Anchi, as well as the Parasite team for the opportunity to host um, Alex for the studio visit. And I just like to say that I think it's a commendable effort to have a paid studio visit. Yeah. And thanks, Alex, as well, for being on board uh, with the studio visit and having us. So, yeah, I'll pass it to Joseph then. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Joseph. I'm based in Hong Kong. I'm an artist and curator. I'm currently working in a local media organization called Video Touch. And I'm also involved in some. Uh, independent uh, art project and uh, art collective and I um, want to uh, express my uh, thank you to Parasite to, and Alex and uh, maybe we should start the studio visit. Oh, so you're throwing the ball to me, huh? <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, um, well, yeah, Alex, why don't you uh, introduce a bit about yourself and your practice then? Sure. Um, thanks, Parasite, for inviting me and also um, Rafi and Joseph for moderating this studio visit. And yeah, um, about myself, um, how should I start? Well, I does a lot of stuff with sound and music and uh, I'm also known, known as a music producer uh, called Alex Molism and I'm going to talk about it uh, later. But Currently, I'm studying at City University as in the School of Creative Media. I'm doing a PhD. Um, I'm re researching the um, club music culture that uh, there's one uh, specific uh, genre called the deconstructed club music that I've been working on lately. So, and then also this sort of genre thing is um, also that uh, my music is uh, sort of being included in that category, but I was trying to um, trying to look into the postmodernism and post internet in these kind of music. But um, I started doing. Uh, I actually I was trained classically um, as a violinist and also a composer. Uh, I study. Uh, music composition at the Hong Kong Baptist University uh, back in the time when I was doing my bachelor degree and then I um, and then I uh, go on and then like I, I actually study sonic art so sonic art uh, for my master degree at uh, Goldsmiths in London so uh, there was a turn for me to um, expand my practice as a composer into the realm of sound art. And after I finished um, uh, the study and I came back to Hong Kong and I was sort of self-proclaimed sound artist for quite a few years. And, and, and I decided to go back to music mm -hmm. and then I decided to do club music. Well, not exactly club music, but um, it's still music in a sense, but uh, which is different from the music that I used to uh, study back in the school. Well, I've got to explain later. So um, thanks for coming to the studio visiting. And um, as you're watching uh, the video, uh, I'm actually sitting in my room, different from the room that you are sitting. There's a reference. Um, uh, so uh, let me first talk about... Uh, yeah, uh, Alex. Yeah. 
Sorry, uh, maybe we can just um, share with the audiences. So um, everyone else who's online, if you have a question for Alex, um, please feel free to put it inside the chat. Um, and if you feel that it's imperative that you have to ask the question then and then and then, so maybe just unmute yourself and ask the question. But other than that, um, Joseph and myself will be uh, monitoring the chat for questions along, along the way. Uh, and maybe, uh, Alex, if you don't mind, maybe I can start uh, with one question that sure. can probably bring you into um, the, the part that we're going to talk about, TKO, your album. Sure. Yeah, so um, as I was um, getting to know your practice, right, I was reading some interviews that you had done before. And there was one particular interview that I think uh, uh, I, I found something quite fascinating. So um, the, the writer was... Um, sharing an anecdote where like, you know, he says this um, electronic beat maker um, from LA called Flying Lotus. So yep. this um, musician said that he only understood the solo music of another British music producer called Burial only after he visited Britain on a rainy day. So, uh, so like he goes on to ask you the question that, you know, how much of your work is reflected by the place that you create your works from? So um, I'm also thinking a lot about uh, like artists and electronic musicians such as Fatima Al Qadari, whose work is very very much informed by her lived experience. So she grew up in uh, amidst an invaded and ravaged and war torn war torn Kuwait, and so um, that very much influences her sonic soundscapes and her musical imaginations. So maybe to begin with, uh, could you share a little bit about your album TKO? the motivations behind it, as well as the perhaps conceptual underpinning of the work. And maybe you could also describe how your immediate environment, like especially so in the context of Sung Kwan Po, right? Where you have been residing and its relation yeah. to your album TKO and how it actually informs the work that you make. Sure. Um, long story short, um, I create or I produce this album uh, TKO uh, in 2018 summer and it was officially released uh, by the end of uh, 2018 in December and well I feel like um, there's something um, is rather you know, difficult for me as an artist to actually just to work on something uh, on my own and then to uh, put it out as some sort of artworks because um, I was trained as a composer and how a composer works in uh, the system is that they usually receive a commissions and then through the commissions they create uh, works or composition most of the time and Nowadays, a lot of like professional composers, they rely on these kind of practice to maintain um, as a, you know, a career. Well, so it was uh, a bit uh, trouble for me to actually to work on some music and uh, just to put it out uh, through maybe a label because I was just working on my own alone without uh, thinking about, oh, I'm going to put it out uh, through uh, some platforms or maybe I'm someone's actually commissioned me to work on it. No, actually, no. The whole TKO album is something that I just work on it totally on my own without any form of um, commissions, no uh, invitations as such. And there was a time when... Um, so as an artist, like you always have some moment when you wandering around in your place because like you're kind of free and then you got nothing to do. And I was wandering around in my neighbor and then I was uh, at one on on a particular one day I was observing the cityscape of the uh, TKO, Trangwan O, Trangwan O. And I was noticing there's a lot of, like, you know, small nuances of, like, the buildings, the cityscape, where they kind of create some sort of, like, a, 
you know, um, I, I won't call it aesthetic, but maybe, wow, some kind of image, imagery of the suburban uh, conditions of Hong Kong. Well, suburban is the idea behind TKO because TKO is considered to be like a satellite city, uh, which is a suburban area of Hong Kong, which only developed um, after or around 80s and 90s, where like all the lands that I am living on are built upon a land field. So basically, there's no history of this place. And but there are some landmark and uh, there's some um, personal experience when throughout the time that I spent in this area of place. So in this album, um, I have like several tracks here and maybe each track I will just play, uh, you know, five seconds or maybe some part of it, like the opening track. Okay, guys, here. So you can hear like the beginning of this track. I actually uh, reference um, uh, a YouTube on where like, you know, it's a video about the development of this area. And that was, that was the thing that I sampled from the internet uh, on the YouTube, which actually to describe uh, the, well, saying about like, you know, Changwen O is like a new development of Hong Kong, how there's like the, the numbers of population and all those information, hard information about this place. So I kind of begin the journey. The music is very repetitive though, because like when I was making those like synthesized all these melodic lines, I was thinking about, oh, I see all the buildings, they all look similar. And then they were like chasing each other like visually. So that was, you know, some visual or uh, audiovisual like, you know, connotation. And then also this video done by Joseph. Oops, sorry. So like, um, so this is a jo uh, Joseph contribution to this video. So basically, uh, TKO is also a project that I collaborate with uh, a group of video artists from Hong Kong called Video Cipher, where each of uh, the, the members contribute to each track to create like a video loop. So let's see, like this is the second video, uh, Fellow Room. Oops, it's loading. I'm not sure why it's loading that slow. But you get the idea, it's a video loop. So basically what you're seeing is a loop of the video. So this like, you know, like a human, you know. Like they're spinning around. So Velodrum is a landmark of my area. Uh, you know, Velodrome is a place where the cycling competition took place, right? And this is also like one character of the music is that it's so repetitive. And then it keeps spinning and spinning and then the melody are chasing each other, very minimalistic. And But there are also some other things that are like, you know, N796. This is like a more like energetic, more... Um, upbeat kind of um, uh, music. So N seven nine six is a night bus that connect the uh, the central Mongkok area to uh, or the TST area to uh, Changwen O, which is a very fast uh, road that it only takes you like thirty minutes back from the city center. To try one note during the night is a night bus. The video, like the artist, she, uh, he did that uh, is using some of the video that I took on the bus, and then he sort of like you know recreate or 
try to manipulate or work around with like a visual image of the journey of uh, the best journey. Yeah, oh, actually, uh, Alex, yeah. I was just going to ask as well, like, could you share more about the idea behind the video works? Like, were the artists involved, um, you know, just interpreting your sounds or did you have sort of like conversations with them to brief them about, you know, the sentiments behind music? Yeah, sure. Um, I did gave some of my uh, videos that I took in TKO area, but I only set out some rules, uh, a very few rules for them to make the video. So the first rule is uh, I was asking all the video should be done in black and white. And, and that's it. And uh, the second rule is uh, really up to them to do whatever they want. Like some, some artists, they came up like a, almost like a music video, like the same length as you know the music but some of them only contribute like a video loop like like for example like uh so yeah um some some video is actually fun because like you know like for track five raw meat it's actually it's actually there's like a well you know story but it's a little bit explicit is that uh, that's like a talk about the experience of sort of like, you know, eyes cruising around in the gyms that I used to work out in Changwon O. So the video that I took is like, um, I put a, a cell phone camera on the tr uh, treadmill and then the whole video is me running on the treadmill and that's the video. Oh, I don't wanna. And then, like you know, this bacon is not done by me, but like the artist decided to like a bacon video in this video. So raw meat is basically siu sin yo in a sense, which means like you know that observations of like you know uh, siu sin yo in the gym sort of that kind of like you know feeling, and the music is kind of industrial techno ish, and yeah, and like this whole album basically uh, is um, all about my own experience that uh, reflect upon, you know, living in TKO for so many years, like maybe almost 20 or maybe like 19 years. I haven't really actually counted. And each track kind of like reflect a little bit of annoyance of things. And I do put a sort of like a statement on, you know, the idea behind TKO, talk about uh, landfill, talk about, um, you know, um, capitalist uh, surplus or consumerism, blah, 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 blah. But I do think they, 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 they laid out sort of like a background to talk about people who live on this land, the, the, act, the actual experience and how utilitarian is when you actually realize that you don't have a story to tell about this place and then at the end of the day you just talk about you and yourself living in this place uh, what kind of things that you encounter etc etc blah 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 so it's kind of pale i would say but i think it kind of connect to a lot of people that who also live in similar uh you know, suburban environment when you don't have much to say or to speak about the place. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I'm not gonna play everything, but just if if you're gonna uh, uh if you are interested in the music, just go on alexmolism.bankham.com or search Alex Molism on Spotify and Bankham, and then you can 
you can you can hear the listen to her whole whole music. Oh, and 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 also the uh album cover uh is done by Suze Chen, a very talented uh local uh designer. She is also living in Chengguan. Oh, so she told me she actually she used like a map of Chengguan. Oh, to sort of lay out this kind of like you know. Uh, I don't even know how to call like you know it's very like you know subtle, but with all the like you know lines and dots that create some sort of like a very atmospheric um, uh, feelings of the place. So yeah, do check out Swiss Chen artworks. Got anything to add, Joseph? Um, I guess no. Maybe we can move to your more like the more sound art like practice. Like I, I like your work, uh, you millions. I embrace you a lot. That uh, participating with uh, uh, participation. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so now, um, so what I'm presenting today is sort of um in uh. Kind of like an anti, you know, uh, and for uh, what is it called? Like you know, anti-clockwise, or like you know, like I'm doing. I'm talking about things that I did in the past. So you minions, I embrace you. Uh, this is a word. Uh, this is the the title is actually a quote from uh, Beethoven's uh, "Ode to Joy," uh, which uh, I also incorporate the music of Beethoven in this work. Uh, so basically, this way is very simple. The premise is simple, is that uh, in the participation, I teach a group of participants to sing the music of Beethoven, particularly "O to Joy" in German. <laughs> There was a um, I, I I put out like an event on Facebook, and then I asked for people who came to join the participation. And of course, I actually want I actually want them that there's gonna be singing involved, so they uh, still have a choice to you know join or not. And. Because like I I I I used to sing in a choir as well, so I still remember all sort of like tricks and techniques that uh to actually train or to warm up with the choir. So I actually uh, apply all the tricks and in the techniques to warm up with the choir, and then I also spend time to teach them how to pronounce the German words. So basically, the whole experience is uh so. Like a rehearsal experience. Since maybe some of them, our audience may have experience or may have not. And then at the end of the performance, I actually ask the audience to go to the balcony of the, you know, space, and then I ask so, them to uh, perform. Um, coming for today's performance, so we are going to sing together for the. And also by the end of the performance. I asked the audience to hand in the score to back to me while they will keep looping the singing. I actually tried to ask the, the audience to memorize the, uh, the the music as much as possible. While I when I collect all the score back and then I uh, burn it. <laughs> So basically, all the audience, they that moment they already forget how to sing the lyrics, but they only remember the melody. Yep. So that was like a, like a small performance I did. So uh, I actually did it twice. Uh, the one that uh, the first one I did in Hong Kong, uh, there was like an extra section that I did at, by the end of performance. Is that I I I did like a I, I did a little bit singing on myself, that I I sing a little bit uh another song uh uh what was it called like you know the the song that you sing when 
like you know during the new year what was it called? I forget actually uh da 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 uh, oh shit, I forget the, the name of the song. I, I used to actually memorize the lyrics. Should all acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Anyway. So, got, got any things to, 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 to reflect upon this work? Uh... Because I think it's very interesting that many of you were involved the uh, audience participation or engagement. And what do you think about uh, repositioning the spectatorship and democratize the process of your art making through uh, this kind of art practice? And uh, although uh, you have different kind of art practice involved participation, like the, this one in more like a gallery setting, and also uh, we collaborate in some party, and I saw you leading the crowd to dance. And how do you see the this kind of uh, differences in two kind of setting that the audience can enjoy and engage in your practice? Oh sure. Well, you're putting two questions in, <laughs> into one. I'll try to. Uh, well, well, uh, there's one artist or uh, like one idea is quite in, influential to me, and um, the American uh, experimental artist, uh, Kendra Peffler. Uh, she called a very uh, uh, important idea called availableism. Availableism. Um, uh, what availableism uh, is basically means that to make use uh, of the words that are available to you, uh, without actually uh, consider the hierarchy in between all those mediums. It's basically, and she uh, saying, you should not be uh, a prisoner of your own medium, which actually quite important to me because I also feel when. When I work on my own stuff, um, like you know, like from time to time, you you kind of like develop some sort of like obsessiveness onto the things that you'll be working, and like through the process, you kind of lost yourself uh, in that process. And what she she remind me is try not to you know lost lose yourself you know with the medium that you work on maybe think about things that are also available to you instead of just uh one particular mediums like uh like music or performance or maybe some maybe visuals or installation because those are the things that if they are available to you and then they they, they definitely have the potential to uh, become part of your artworks. And talking about the audience, um, thing, the, the thing is, I feel pretty natural about you doing different things in a different um, uh, circumstance, right? And uh, you do not do things that are inappropriate, but the thing is, uh, why is there like a standard or why is there like a, a conventions of these these things why could there be no gallery works happens in a well club space well there might be some uh uh you know uh, institutional um you know things that goes behind but i feel like there's a lot of like practical uh evaluation like you won't you definitely not going to put like a um well a, 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 like an installation in the club because I feel like club would be more appropriate for people to, you know, dance, right? And people got to destroy your work if you put like an insulation uh, in the middle of a dance floor. It could happen. And I've seen some very brilliant um, video works that did on the dance floor. But I feel like um, there's no, and as I said about hierarchy, is that I do not necessarily think um, one should put a piece of artwork in the middle of uh, club space. And I feel like, you know, art space, club space, they are mutual and they should uh, be respect and uh, each by each other. And they, they, they share no hierarchy 
which means that um, there's no art forms belong to another art forms that you should actually try invade, you know, the other art space. Well, but that that actually goes to uh, Rafi on the you know the, the yeah. issues you might yeah, want to actually can, talk about. Yeah, maybe I can just since we're at it, uh, maybe I can just share about like what we've spoken before this. So like, I think we were just talking about. I mean, I, I shared an observation that like there's increasingly uh you know an inclination for like subcultures. And so since we're specifically talking about Alex's work and how he deals with club culture, so how club culture has like increasingly become more subsumed or accepted into like institutional art discourses or like generally mainstream culture. So like I'm thinking also like, you know, observations on how like um, there are more forward thinking institu institutional commissions such as uh, Michel Rizzo's Higher Extension that was I think two years ago at Stage Lake Museum. And then we also see like uh, date modern, including um, music streaming platforms such as Boiler Room and NTS into the uh, you know public programs, and then like increasingly so like more artists are also more artists are also tapping into like you know um, small pockets of you know club culture in their performances that they stage on this kind of institutional settings. Well, like, um, yeah. before so, I yeah. yeah before I go back to your questions, well, uh, there's one thing that I have to emphasize is that, um, which is a thing that to me is that I realized I never really create or make any works that are actually dedicated or to be specific on to a certain place. Mm. Somehow that's uh, the thing that I, 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 I I work and I work and I realize like most of our works doesn't really have like a, a dedicated you know space, which means that uh, it doesn't really matter whether I put my artworks whether in a gallery or in a club or in a uh, uh, like a public areas or not. And I, my I feel like a lot of my work is not really serve the space, but m most of my work is to work around with those spaces that I have some work that could be performed in a gallery but it could also be performed in a club but I also try to work around with the space that uh, that I would put different kind of music I would you know think about what kind of music that I'm going to do to work with the space there's no uh, there's, there's, there's never really a, like a concrete form unless Let's say if a gallery asks me to sell the works, that I might actually have to put out something physical or materialist materialistic for them to sell. But this is only uh, 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 like you know, that's not really my concern. You know, like you know, if I if they asking me to do something to sell, okay, why not? But like more for most of the time. Like, I just <laughs> would try to work around with all those, you know, scenarios, and and I think uh, there's like a the similar mentality for like musicians and producers. They also think that uh, the way they work is try to work around with the system, to work around with institutes, and that might. I mean, this is not the first time when uh, you know. Contemporary Art Institute trying to look into other, you know, uh, mediums of artwork. It happens with sound art. It happens with performance art, electronic art, or maybe internet, digital art. And there's a problem with the, the, the institute where they're trying to include everything that they want, but at the end they can't. And there's some uh, spaces dedicated to like a like uh, Ars Electronica in Aus Austria to specialize in media art. And then it became so many institutes and different institutes doing different things. And I mean, we are not just talking about one institute, right? There's so many institutes. And even club music itself is an institute. Burgai, music festivals, those are also institutes that could be influential on the taste of the music, and then they also decide who get to play or not, and yeah. 
Yeah, it's interesting that you um, um, brought up Bergain because like there was someone, uh, a writer who sort of like proposed, um, you know, how cultural institutes should look at Bergain as a model instead, you know, but like, uh, I guess you're right in saying that, you know, like sometimes you can't fully translate uh, some essence of culture when you remove it from its, you know, uh, specific space. So I, I guess like I had a question along the lines, but you sort of answered it already. But maybe something else that I can ask is about, you know, going back to the idea of audiences. So like if if I may, I can, uh, I, I want to share an anecdote. Like you know, like I was, um, in Shanghai last year for work, you know, at, at an art fair, and then like um, uh, there was a, a club night organized by the artist uh, Tian Zhuo Chen, I think. Oh, Chen Tian Zhuo. So, yeah. Yeah, at all clubs. So like, you know, I, I saw it through the promotional materials that was at the art fair. So like I went along and like, I found it quite fascinating because like there were clearly very two different demographics of people who were there because I think Tian Chao and he runs a regular night, night there. So like, I guess he has a crowd of people who goes there only to get smashed and just be in the music. And, you know, not concerned about, you know, the idea of art and, you know, like a performativity of art. And then, but that night, it was interesting because that, that, there wasn't a demographic of people um, who were from the art fair, you know, and they were coming to the program, to the club night as, as sort of a fringe program of the art fair. So, yeah, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on the idea of these two very separate constituents. Uh, for the lack of a better word, you know, the art world demographic and also the club brief demographic, you know, and how they are coalescing and like what kind of very interesting agencies that can come out of that. Yeah. Well, um, I feel I'm reluctant to actually comment on this thing right now because I feel like there's going to be like a, an, an, like a full hour of discussion. But I mean... Um, it's quite difficult to actually to talk about this issue actually because I, it involves different sectors of people to manage to actually do something together and which is not wrong and I think it's definitely cool but um, maybe it's some sort of like you know um, a phenomenon that happens you know in within these 10 years where like spec, spec you know spec speculate oh no, no, sorry sorry uh, what's it called uh, like a like a spectacle yeah like a like art, the art world is trying to create some sort of like a spectacles to draw people attention together and visually speaking or maybe like even sonically speaking it all came together at one point to like uh, oversaturated to get people uh, uh, all together like to, like to create some sort of like a coolness a coolness well people try to be cool right in the art or maybe in music and I think like this kind of thing is only the syndrome of like the art world <laughs> not you know you know there's a, like a structural issues behind these you know happenings I mean it used to happen in Hong Kong like every art basel was like some like crazy parties but I mean I felt like you know uh, Joseph, you would like to talk about my the other artworks, so or should I present another works? Yeah, yeah, maybe you can uh, tell me about like uh, that short hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure like if this one is still you know politically <laughs> correct now, <laughs> but uh, I'll just talk about it. So basically, hallelujah is I show you some screens, uh, maybe some video. election held on the 26th of March 2017. There are a total of 1,163 valid ballot papers cast. The following is the result of the count. So what you are seeing, what's happening? Uh, 
is that I actually uh, I dubbed the music of uh, Masai, a very famous uh, oratorio by uh, Handel, the German British composer. And then I put a section of music into this video when um, when uh, the current uh, current uh, uh, chief executive collected as uh, like a like a elected as the chief executive of Hong Kong, and that was like a moment, like you know. So basically, like when you know when Carrie Lam came out uh, on the stage to thanks about ah oh, uh, all the election thing, and then like the music goes to Hallelujah, and then like you know she's like you know uh, you know if you watch the imagery of the moment with the music, it gives you shield. Like, you know, that kind of like, you know, the musicality and the imagery clashed and then to create some sort of like a weird harmony. <laughs> It's like all the sound, like you know, the protests uh, in 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 the place and all the stuff that kind of like mixed together, like this, so impactful. I think I I maybe might have missed it, but could you share more more about like the significance of the number seven 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 in this work? Oh yes, yeah, seven 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 is the numbers of. Uh, the the count of how Carrie Lam got e uh, elected as the chief executive of Hong Kong, and seven 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 is also like a numbers, the holy numbers in Christianity, and in the context of Hallelujah, that's you know probably the 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 best music, if not to celebrate, you know Carrie Lam as the chief executive of Hong Kong, and. You know the 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 things with uh, classical music is that um, uh, there's a lot of like you know Christianity themes in classical music, and we like the like as a musician, a uh, classically trained musician, that's almost like part of my language that to consider, and yeah, everyone's belief in God, and so does Carrie Lam, but you know like you know. Maybe she deserved the hallelujah better than me. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very ironic that that Carrie Lam, uh, when she says she will run the election because God told her to do so. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I remember <laughs> that. Actually, this is the 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 moment that inspired from inspired me to make this video because she said God inspired her to, you know, to do the elections. And I think it's even more ironic to watch out because with the uh, legislation of national security law, and I don't know whether this works still, will this be some illegal or <laughs> will be afraid of to do political work like this and under the, the, the law scope? 
Oh, oh yeah, this is a thing. Uh, oh, let me show you maybe some of my new stuff that I've been working on. <laughs> like, uh, let me stop. So the thing is, like, you know, I've been uh uh listening to a lot of metal music recently, and I was so struck by the fact that uh the aesthetic or the visual elements of metal music, that. You know the elements of metal music is pretty. I I was so impressed by the font that they use. So what I mean by font is um. Oh, like you know you see all the like you know tree branches or like some kind of like a a very um uh, like a oh I have to show you to actually to. How am I gonna show it? Why is not working? Oh, I hate it. Yep. Uh, see, this is like um, like a, this is actually like a created. I I I I purchased some metal font, uh, online, and then I I kind of combine it, and then I make this kind of like a metal band. Called Carrie Lamb. You can't really tell it's Carrie Lamb, right? I mean, it kind of obvious, I think. And then I also create some very um, like more sensitive one, like this one. Oh shit! Wait. Oh no! Why is not? Like uh, this one. If you are not seeing the the file document name, you might actually not can't tell. You know what is actually written here. So it's free Hong Kong, <laughs> and revolutions of our time. Trying to make it more at grotesque as it can be, and you know this thing has already kind of like declared by the government is illegal. So. Maybe I, it's gonna get me troubles if I'm gonna showing this, you know, work. Oh, well, I don't know. I don't care. Yeah, or maybe something like you know, um, this is more hardcore, I guess. Ooh, like this is actually national security law, but like six six six, you know, they got like six chapter and six uh, lines, and then like you know, six something. I I forget, like you know. So it's kind of like you know evil, very evil, you know, that metal, especially black metal, that you have to feel, you know, the 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 evilness, that 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 kind of like a perform perform performative elements of uh, metal music is to be evil. But I mean, a lot a lot of people who coming from you know metal music, they are like super good. And nice people, but they have to like portray themselves in a very evil um, way. But they are not evil. In fact, they are probably the best people in the world. And I feel like you know, to create some some sort of like you know, like you know, contrast in terms of like you know, metal with like these kind of like you know, actual like horrific characters in real world is very contradicting actually. So, and then I also um, recently, for some recent performance I did, is that uh, I start uh, learning how to scream uh, by watching YouTube video, and that's how musicians learn new tech, uh, you know, stuff, you know, by watching YouTube a lot of YouTube video, and I can show you uh, a video that uh, uh, that of my recent performance. If you got any questions, you can ask me now. And then, during I'm um, finding this. So screaming, screaming is like you know.
think this one. <laughs> Something like that. Wow, I was screaming, and I wrote a small poetry when I、uh, working on this、uh, performance. That uh, well, kind of political, I guess.、Uh, let me show you the po、uh, poem. Um, yeah, sorry about you know being a little bit disorganized. Uh. Are there any fans of、um, uh, Sylvia Plath? So basically, the whole po poem I did is a paraphrase of Sylvia Plath,、uh, Lady Lazarus. And the army.、Uh, so basically, it start begin with me speaking、uh, out all the numbers: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The army comes back and forth. Searching for the smell, the smell of the dust comes with the fiery ashes. Unveil thy mask, alas, thy faces. Do you tremble? Blood sheds on the land of white flower, and I, a man of nothing, same as Sylvia. So this is a little bit of like self-referencing. To measure the height of grief, all numbers. Are the same with the slender of thy name. This is、uh, a dedication to date, all the numbers in the protest. Walk me up from my head to my feet. All I want is piles of meat. Grinding is a sin, like nothing else. They do it exceptionally well. Basically, this is the same sentence from the poetry. Actually, they do it so well. We feel like hell. They do it so well. We feel real. They guess we could tell we are meant to be the juice of the man. So did Sylvia said, "Do it in a cell, the greatest drama of all time. The blood dries, so as the light dies. Where's my knife? With a hint of pride. Here, general. Here, chairman. I'm your guts. I'm your aorta. The pure mercurial rain." It smells like a bone, like brick and wick. Do not think I overestimate your small mistake. Burn, burn, lamb chow. I pour and lit, screaming,、uh, mourning. There's something there, under the flesh. I speak the magic word, and I vanish like a turd. So this is like a a poetry. Well, after Lady Lazarus, that I I I was. You know, screaming the poetry into this、uh, sound performance I did、uh, like few weeks ago last month at Twenty Alpha, which is a experimental music、uh, space in Hong Kong. So I've been like ah,、uh, you know, doing you know this lately lately, looking into metal music, and then screaming. These kind of stuff. Well, some of maybe it sounds like I'm going apart from, well, club music. But actually, a lot of people that I met in the scene, they are all metal music listener. So it's pretty interesting because like, uh, certainly it's not really like you know people like in the scene is they have a very diverse music taste and. I mean, I learn from them a lot. Like you know, they listen way more than than me. You know, you know, and then like you know, by looking into different genres of music, keep you know inspiring me as an artist. I guess. Um. Yeah. 
And I feel like if I'm gonna put out some more new music, that probably it's gonna be uh, maybe still in the spectrum of club, but with metal influence, or even I would just go straight hardcore, something like that. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I recently I also looked into a lot of like you know Canton disco from the uh, 90s and millennium, like you know. But that's another topic. Uh, any anyone got questions for me? Yeah, uh, Joseph, do you have any more questions for uh, Alex? Um, maybe I'm also curious that uh, as an queer artist, and you often address your sexual identity through your artistic practice, like uh, you you got a word called homo, and also another word also address. Uh, uh, your sexuality and I, I wondered uh, how how do you think that uh, art as a way to empowering the, the queer queer community to to express themselves oh I'm not sure if the word is still uh, available the one called you call homo let me check oh my god the QR code is not working anyway and I might actually take it down but well, I mean, I feel like you know nowadays when we are talking about uh, you know LGBTQ community as a uh, well cisgender gay person and also uh, I mean Asian, but in Asia is in East Asia that I'm somehow you know privileged and white you know that I do think I don't have much to say about LGBTQ, or I would say uh, that, you know, I'm not in the position to empower anyone, but mm. because I feel like sometimes, like, you know, um, a, lot, a, a lot of time being a cis gay is somehow, I feel a bit, you know, well, I won't say normalized, but, you know, Compared to people who are like, you know, transsexual or maybe uh, uh, non-binary people that my experience is very insignificant. And I feel like I have a lot of learn from, you know, people who are actually in real struggles. And I somehow like, you know, I did some queer related work, but the work that I did the one that I uh, I did call song to Daphnis is uh, a work that uh, to dealt with uh, the issue with Orientalism. That you know how all those like you know Oriental, you know sexual and relationship you know experience being portrayed in movies and uh, uh, and in 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 fictions and etc. and that 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 was a word that I dedicated to, like you know, my own experience. That I was dating, you know, a white guy when I was in London. That you know, that experience. Think about whether myself is being uh, subjectified to, uh, objectified or not, as an Asian person. But I I feel like, um, yeah, the 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 reason why I don't really uh does a lot of uh, queer works is that I realize uh, I don't really see myself queer enough, should I say. Is that, you know, you know, um, that's the thing that uh, I feel like if I pretend myself uh, as a non-binary or queer, that is not, you know, that's not... <laughs> You, you don't really see it in myself, right? And then if I'm not that kind of person that I'd rather not be that kind of things, you know, you know, instead of like, like being called out by people by pretending, you know, queer or whatever, but in reality, I'm too cis, you know, gay and something like that. And so I would say, um, I won't say I'm reluctant, but I do, I do think a lot in such a way because I'm not gay enough to speak about gay experience, even I sometimes speak as uh, about gay experience myself. Yeah. 
how is it so weird to say I'm not gay enough? <laughs> Uh, All right. Uh, shall we open uh, the floor yeah. to the audiences? So, does anyone uh, in the audience has a question for Alex? Please feel free to unmute yourself and just you know ask him. Wow, so quiet today. You you can type or maybe like if you got any questions, you can ask. Anyone? Hi, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me or well. Mm. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the conversation and sharing your work and your music, even in this format that I know it's it's, it's quite tricky. Um, I was actually just curious about the what you just said um, about in terms of like our like identity politics and the, the relationship that you feel you have or you don't have with like, uh, you know, or let me rephrase it, like how you feel you can be the one can kind of represent uh, someone or a, a group of people or you don't feel that way. Like, I think if you can just expand, if you have more thoughts on like, just this idea of like gender and representation and also like, wanting to give the platform maybe to other people that feel more like in not necessarily in co not confident but just that they think it's their platform versus what you might feel or experience. I think in this moment in particular like it feels very I don't know yeah I, I do think like you know um I feel like to actually expand the platform for LGBTQ people uh has to do with uh the systemic uh uh, uh, issues or maybe like you know how people actually you know try to give out opportunities to people as an artist myself and um, when I you know like behind the scene thing is that if I realize there's like a problem with uh, the how institute to put out a shows about LGBTQ people with their you know, LGBTQ people, or maybe they do do not include enough or diversity. That I will actually voice out, you know, to the curator, because as an artist myself, uh, I do, uh, I also see myself as a you know privilege as a cisgender gay, you know, in Hong Kong. That a lot of people who are minority or and queer, they will probably has you know, it's not even a chance to actually present them, themselves. And the issues about to be confident enough to speak about myself or maybe to empower people is that um, the things about cis gay, you know, cis gay, you know, cisgender gay is, you know, culturally speaking, even, you know, there's like a awareness of, you know, well, at least like in our field of uh, dynamics, in the cultural scene, cis being a cis gay is somehow quite normalized, I would say. That the representation of cis gay people in the cultural scene is more than enough, I would say. There's so many gay peoples in the art scene. And especially, you know, cis gender, a uh, uh, male, uh, I would say, I, I, I should, male, cis, male, you know, gay. And then I feel like, you know, instead of like trying to claim even more, and uh, I have to think about what kind of things that I try, I, I am representing, you know, like what kind of experience I'm telling, what kind of story that I'm telling uh, about myself being gay. And if there's nothing new, to add on to this discourse, or if my experience is not, you know, um, well, you know, like, you know, like, if my experience fall or fell into that kind of like a, stereo a stereotype, and I would rather not to speak about it, because like, you know, we have so many people, you know, we have so little uh, space for people to actually showcasing their work, and if my, spe my experience is not special enough, just, you know, 
there's there's some more like you know people deserve to actually bring out you know a deeper levels of in issues within the LGBTQ community, and I've seen a lot of like you know uh, gay people in Hong Kong is very you know almost I I don't want to use the word but you know bourgeois or middle class you know somehow like you know when I think about like you know uh, the class structure with gay people is that actually a lot of gay people male gay people in Hong Kong they are very successful you know they are also occupying you know certain levels of uh, you know a social system in our society and you know like but like you know you actually you can you can see that like you know where's the lesbian where's the transsexuals gone like you know you can't really see any of them seeing you know those people being represented in the media so that's why i you know as a you know cis gay you know i feel like you know i should you know just you know you know tone down myself try not to focus me being you know part of the you know lgbtq member but but you know they deserve more i guess is that answering your questions i guess so much and also is the idea of um, being in solidarity with other people and understanding that maybe that's their platform more than uh, our own I think it's very exactly uh, solidarity is that I rather say is that uh, I have a different understanding is that I want to voice out my solidarity but I want to put it into action instead of like telling people I'm you know you know giving us solidarity with people because like this is a so performative you know yeah which is often the case unfortunately in the arts when it kind of just stops at this kind of like facade instead of actually you know doing it so, yeah. yeah thank you so much no problems all right uh thank you so much martha for the question uh alex i think we have a question from um, someone called a so oh, the yeah. person is asking uh has being in london I think in reference to, you know, you being in Goldsmith, uh, influence your view, creative work in any way? Oh, yeah, it does. And I think it gave me a different perspective on the club culture, I would say. Or also, it gave me like a perspective of how music could be, in a sense. And it also gave me um, inspiration or give me even further critiques on the institution I would say because I after London uh, well like you know they have like you know so many institutes they have so many uh, you know institute like Hong Kong that I also like try to you know strike for or try to you know fight for the resource from you know government and etc comparatively speaking they, uh, they they enjoy a lot more than hong kong but at the same time i realize you know the scene in london is actually not as good as hong kong in a sense well it's a weird way to put because i feel like you know um but like it's different because like there's a, a very strong locality you know with those institutes in london even uk they really put a lot of effort on to on a local level to uh, promote or to actually to build a community, but the thing is with London is all those institutes, small institutes, they also uh, strongly reliant on you know uh, government funding, and they kind of like you know each institute create their own cult of followers. <laughs> Sounds a little bit you know you know, bad way to put, well, I'm not saying it's bad, but I think like, you know, it happens everywhere anyway. And what, when I back to Hong Kong and I realized if London is considered one of the, like, you know, biggest art scene in the world. So maybe Hong Kong is actually not far, but that far back. I mean, Hong Kong is comparatively speaking, not bad in terms of art scene compared to London, I guess. But maybe after the NSL, maybe things change. And I feel like, you know, the the, the, the economy or, you know, that 
when there was Art Basel in Hong Kong, it happens every year. And it's actually not, it's healthy, or, uh, it's not healthy. <laughs> if we relying on Art Basel that much for people to come visit, you know, Hong Kong local art scenes, you know, thinking about carbon footprint, print, that's already an issue, right? I mean, environmental things is a real issue. And also, I feel like a lot of time Hong Kong is being treated some sort of like a tokenism in terms of uh, people from the West to when later they try to portray Hong Kong as a uh, liberal or whatever, a uh, freedom fighter, that kind of things. And, you know, I somehow I feel very complicated. And I do realize uh, that we have no choices that we are being in the middle of a sandwich. Like the, the issues with, you know, people talk talking about Hong Kong as, you know, like people losing their freedoms, et cetera, et cetera. And holy shit, like, you know, uh, it, think about, I'm actually like, you know, if like, you, you listen to those people talk about Hong Kong, you feel like, oh my God, like, you know, what kind of place is Hong Kong like in their eyes? It's like a third country or like, you know, whatever. Like, Somehow, like, you know, I spend a lot, enough time to actually DJ and to hang out with people from China. All I can say is um, the situation of Hong Kong is definitely uh, uh, bad. But for people who work in the club culture, art culture, you know, people in China, they already been like, you know, living under such, you know, you know, you know, constraint of, you know, freedom then maybe we are just, you know, uh, being uh, absorbed by the same system now, but that if they could still doing it, so we can, right? <laughs> you know, just without, you know, well, bad, bad you, know, you know, some level of freedom or, I mean, that, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't do work, you can't speak about yourself or maybe get you trouble. I don't know. We'll see. It's too early to say about the NSL. Uh, is there any other question from anyone? Because I think we're uh, a bit beyond the time. Yeah. Any questions? I don't know. Like I feel like I've been just, you know, I, I get up quite early today and I feel like a bit, you know, pass out now. <laughs> All right, Joseph. Uh, Joseph, do you have? Uh, do you want to ask one last question, or should we wrap it up? Uh, I think we should wrap it up. I, I'm running out of questions. <laughs> <laughs> and Alex, do you have any shows? Uh, no matter it's your music or art coming up in Hong Kong or any other places. I I, I don't have any shows now, but uh, I should actually ask you guys to. Uh, maybe to come to my friend's show <laughs> at Tycoon. But I'm not sure whether it's going to happen or not because of the the lockdown. They're closed for two weeks from this week, but uh, I think they will reopen at some point. Are they going to close for two weeks at Tycoon? So. Yeah. Oh, yes, maybe... So. I mean, like, you know, supposedly, like, there was, like, a show for my friends on uh, July, uh, July 20, 24th, but I'm not sure whether it's going to go on or not, but, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't have anything to add on, to be honest, but, well, I thought Rafi was asking me about club culture, but maybe we can leave it, you know, later. Oh, but if you wanna talk about it, go ahead and yeah. talk about it. Rafi? Uh I think a separate discussion. Yeah, maybe separate discussion, yeah. Yeah. So uh for everyone else, I think uh you can find Alex on Instagram to keep up to date with his uh you know activities as well as his website. And that's it, Anshi. I think I pass it to you. Yeah. Um. Is this the show you are talking about? Yeah. Sound forms. Oh, uh, it's yeah. got postponed. Okay. Postponed. Yeah. 
but good that we're we're aware of the show now um yeah to a later date didn't say when but well uh, well let's see yeah but this is happening at Daegun called uh sound forms right yeah sound forms so the one of the curator i mean uh one is a uh, hera and then another curator oh. Is um uh, uh Remy Remy is a friend of mine from Vancouver, and I don't think he's gonna be here in Hong Kong anyway. But he also curated the show, and then the second day of the show sound forms uh that night is gonna perform by uh ASJ and all Nerve. So ASJ is a friend of mine. She uh gonna release on the label Absurd Tracks, which is a Hong Kong uh. Well, club, a uh, Hong Kong based, you know, club music or experimental music label, mm-hmm. and Nerve is the boss of Twenty Alpha, that the experimental music space that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Twenty Alpha is an experimental music space located in Wan Chai Fu Duck Building, and I think twelfth floor or thirteenth floor. I forget exactly, but like it's a space that dedicate to uh. All sorts of like experimental club and even sound art in Hong Kong, and I I highly recommend you guys to check out or follow that uh space. You can search Twenty uh and Alpha on Facebook. So a uh, Twenty, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Twenty Alpha, and well, I don't have any gigs, and I don't think I'm gonna have any gigs any soon because I mean. There's lockdown, and then we don't know, even know uh, how the third way is gonna go. And yeah, maybe see you in CTU, but I don't even need to go back to school. <laughs> stay home. Yeah, you say stay home. All right, thank you so thank much, you very much. You, Alex. Thank you, Joseph, Rafi, and everybody uh, showing up today to um, join the student visit. So see you guys later. Maybe at, at um, other programs, Alex will be presenting, and you also can go back to the recording of today's studio visit at Paris's YouTube channel. So yeah, that's called it a night. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye, bye, guys. Bye. Thank bye. you, Alex and Joseph. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you, Anchi. Thank you, Anchi. Thank you, Anchi. Thank you, Josie. Thank you. Bye.